Hi, this is Dr. Dearden, and I'm doing a review for Unit 2 of Physical Science 100 at Brigham Young University. This covers chapters 10 through 17, and a lot of it is about development of a good model for the atom. So as with the other reviews, what I'll do is go through some of what I think are the most important concepts, and then uh, we'll just do some practice problems, some eye type problems. So here we go. As I said, a lot of what this uh, unit is about is about development of a good model for the atom. And so I want to kind of go through a summary of the experiments that led us to our current model for the atom. Some of the earliest experiments were done with uh, gas discharge tubes. Um, these were the experiments of J.J. Thompson and his group and they put an electrical current through a tube of gas and what they found was that no matter what gas they used they always got the same negative particles. Um, well I should back up and say that when they did these discharge experiments they observed that all atoms were made of negative particles and positive particles. And then, as I was saying, no matter what gas they used, they always got the same negative particles. They were able to measure the mass-to-charge ratio by putting those particles through uh, magnetic and electric fields and using the electromagnetic force laws that we talked about in Unit 1. And basically what they found was that it was the same kind of negative particle no matter what gas they use. We now call those negative particles electrons. So electrons are part of all atoms. The positive particles that they observed were different. They depended on what kind of gas you were doing um, the, the experiments with, what you put in the tube. And the positive parts we now call uh, positive ions or atomic nuclei, they varied depending on the element. And so Thomson developed a, a model for the atom based on these experiments, which was called the plum pudding model, or you can think of it as the raisin bread model, if you will, um, where the positive part, which was known to be a lot more massive than the negative part, was uh, like the bread and the negative parts, or the electrons, were like little flecks of raisins that were spread throughout the bread. Another early experiment was the Millikan oil drop experiment. This is the one that was done by Robert Millikan with his assistant Harvey Fletcher, who was LDS, and he was, he was a grad student. And uh, Millikan won the Nobel Prize for the experiment, and Fletcher got his PhD for the experiment. But uh, basically what happened in this experiment was they sprayed oil as a fine mist and that produced little tiny droplets of oil that were charged. They did it under conditions that put charge on the droplets. And then they used an electric field to affect the motion of the oil drops. It was the electric field pulling the drops up and gravity causing the drops to fall. And if you change the voltage and changed the electric field and got it just right, you could make the droplets just hover in the little microscope that was used to watch the experiment. And from this experiment, because they knew the strength of the electric field they were using, they could use the electromagnetic force law, which we talked about before, to calculate the charge that was on the droplet. And what they found was the charge couldn't be just any old number. It always came in integer multiples of a certain small value. And what they realized was that small value was the charge on the electron. And so you couldn't have half of an electron or a third of an electron. You could have either one or two or three, an integer number. And so that meant that the charge was quantized. It only came in certain values. And so this allowed them to measure the charge on the electron. The mass to charge ratio was already known from Thompson's experiments earlier. And so once they knew the charge, they could also calculate the mass. And they realized that the electron mass was very small. And that was worth the Nobel Prize, as I said, for Millikan. The next really important experiment was the one done by Rutherford. And he was attempting to test the plum pudding model of Thompson. 
And this was the experiment where Rutherford had a piece of radioactive metal, I think it was polonium, that produced alpha particles. Uh, alpha particles are positively charged. Well, what we now know they are is they are helium nuclei. But they're positively charged and fairly low in mass, and they come out of this uh, polonium metal with fairly high energy. And so what Rutherford did was he, or really his students did, was he made a beam of alpha particles and then shot them through a very thin piece of gold foil. And what they were expecting to happen was that the alpha particles would go through the foil with very little deflection because they'd be shooting these high energy positive particles kind of through that that plum pudding and they might get slowed down a little bit but they weren't going to move very much and when they did the experiment that was mostly what they saw but they were careful and what they found was that some of the alpha particles didn't just deflect a little bit some of them deflected a lot some of them even bounced almost straight back and that was completely unexpected and the only way to explain that was by realizing that the plum pudding model had to be wrong because this experiment showed that nearly all the mass in those gold atoms had to be in a very small space and that was also the part that had to be positively charged. Why? Well, because the alpha particles were positively charged, and the only thing that could repel them and make them come straight back like that would be a small, dense, heavy, positively charged region in the gold atoms. And so what Rutherford's experiment proved was that the atom has a very small, dense, positively charged nucleus, and it proved that the plum pudding model was wrong. And so Rutherford developed a new model for the atom, a planetary model, where he said that the atom was like a solar system with the nucleus being like the sun in that the nucleus has almost all the mass right at the center and the electrons were orbiting around the nucleus like the planets orbit around the sun. Of course that model didn't last very long, it was disproven too pretty quickly. The next key set of experiments had to do with the measurement of atomic spectra and particularly that of hydrogen. You remember that, and we did this, uh, well I guess we didn't really do it in Salt Lake, but we usually do it in class, where we take tubes that are filled with hydrogen and we pass a gas discharge through it and you get a, a kind of a reddish pink light and if you look at that light through a diffraction grating or something that can separate the light into its wavelengths, you see that the light that's coming out is not all the colors of the rainbow. Instead, it's just some very narrow lines, spectral lines. So we call that kind of emission discrete emission, as opposed to continuous, which would be all the colors of the rainbow. And so a successful model of the atom had to explain the line spectrum that you got from atomic emission and particularly that of hydrogen. And of course the model that did that successfully was the Bohr model. So here is a summary of those models of the atom again. First, the earliest one was the plum pudding or Thompson model where the negative electrons are like raisins in raisin bread where the bread would be the positive part. And this explained the fact that the negative charges had low masses and that the positive charge had high mass. But this model wasn't consistent with Rutherford's gold foil uh, experiment, the alpha particle scattering experiment, and so had to be abandoned. Um, the Rutherford model was the next one. We call that the nuclear or solar system model. And it explained that small, dense, positively charged nucleus, um, but it failed to explain how it was that electrons could orbit around the positive nucleus because remember, if an electron is moving in a circular orbit, that electron is experiencing accelerated motion. And if you have a charge experiencing accelerated motion, other rules of physics say that that charge has to be radiating energy. And if it's radiating energy, it couldn't be in a stable orbit. The orbit would decay and it would fall into the nucleus and that would be the end. Also, Rutherford's model didn't explain the discrete spectral lines that we just talked about. So the next model was the Bohr model. And the Bohr model did explain the hydrogen discrete line spectrum. 
what Bohr did was he assumed that those orbiting electrons could only have certain values of angular momentum. And if they can only have certain values of angular momentum, then they can only have certain energies. And if they can only have certain energies, they can only transition between certain energies, and that explained the line spectra. Now, the Bohr model wasn't perfect either. First of all, it worked only for one electron atoms, well, hydrogen and hydrogen-like atoms. So it didn't work for anything else on the periodic table, and that was a problem. Also, Bohr just assumed that angular momentum had to be quantized, but his model didn't explain why it needed to be quantized, so that was a problem. And then his model had the same problem, couldn't explain why the atom was stable at all, because the orbiting electrons should have been radiating energy, and they weren't. And finally, uh, Bohr's model wasn't consistent with some newer discoveries, the wave-particle duality of the electron, or the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So let's talk about those two things. First, wave-particle duality. Um, you remember we showed wave-particle duality for light by noticing that light can do certain things. It does things that only waves do, namely diffraction and interference. But it also has particle behavior and the things that are particulate that can't be explained any other way by, or than by assuming that light is particulate is uh, the way light arrives on a detector when you have very dim light. It shows up as little dots. You know, it hits the de detector in discrete spots, like what's shown over here. Um, it doesn't start out dim and then just get brighter. It's a bunch of little discrete spots. Um, the second experiment that showed wave-particle duality of light was the photoelectric e effect experiment, which um, Einstein explained. And that was that experiment where you shine light on metal and you got electrons coming off the metal as long as the wavelength of the light was short enough or the energy of the photons was high enough. And if your light was too red, that is if your wavelengths were too long, your frequency was too low, then you never got photoelectrons no matter how bright or how intense the light was. And the only way to explain that was that light is arriving as little packets of energy, which we now call photons, and the photon energy depended on the frequency of the light. If the frequency is high, then the energy is high. And high frequencies correspond to short wavelengths. Okay, so that was light. But the key thing here is that electrons also have wave-particle duality. Um, when electrons hit a detector, they hit as individual particles. And so they definitely have particle behavior. But the really curious thing was that... Uh, as um, de Broglie had said, the electrons also behave like waves. They, he predicted that they would diffract and interfere, and then Davison and Germer actually did the experiment when they shot electrons at a, a nickel crystal. The electrons passing between the atoms have about the same wavelength as the spacing between the atoms, and that meant that they diffracted and interfered. And so you see patterns like are shown in the picture over here. They arrive as single particles, but where they arrive uh, shows a wave pattern or an interference pattern. And that was really key to understanding the way atoms behave. So electrons, like photons, have wave-particle duality because they arrive as particles, but the probability of where they hit is described by a wave. Remember that the wavelength of the electrons is equal to Planck's constant, h, divided by the product of the mass times the speed. And what that means is the wavelength is always very small um, because Planck's constant is a very small number. And that's why you can't normally see the wave behavior of electrons um, 
and it's also why it's only very light particles like electrons show their wave behavior because the mass is in the denominator of this figure and so the smaller the mass the longer the wavelength. Wavelengths have to be big enough or you don't see anything. We also need to talk briefly about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle uh, which says that there are limits to how much you can know simultaneously about the position and the momentum of small particles. Uh, a way to think about it is that particles like electrons are detected by their interaction with light. But when a photon collides with an electron, that's like a bomb. I mean, the photon is energy, and so when it hits, it completely destroys the whatever trajectory the electron was on before. It doesn't destroy the electron, but it certainly changes its motion. And an analogy is it's sort of like if you were trying to follow the path of a baseball in a dark stadium by throwing grenades at it and hitting it every once in a while. Yeah, if you hit the baseball with a grenade and the grenade goes off, you know where the baseball was when it hit, but you know nothing about where it's going afterward, assuming that it's not destroyed. And uh, so the Heisenberg uncertainty principle had to be taken into account in any good model of the atom as well. So it said there's a limit to how much you can know about a single electron or any other small particle. The more you know about where it is, the less you know about its momentum, which is the product of the mass times the velocity. And what this means is that Newtonian mechanics, Newton's laws of motion, don't work when things get very small because Newtonian mechanics assume you can measure position and motion together exactly, and Heisenberg realized that really wasn't possible. Okay. All right, well, let's look at a few problems. Here are a set of four graphs. Oh, and um, as with the other reviews, what I recommend you do is when I put up a problem like this, I'll pause for a little bit. I recommend that you pause the video and answer the question for yourself and then I'll tell you what the answer is. So here's the question. Which graph properly reflects the relationship between wave frequency and wavelength? I'm going to wait, let you answer. Okay, so let's uh, take a look here. The relationship between frequency and wavelength. Well, as I think back, I know that frequency and wavelength are inversely proportional to each other. So that means that if the frequency gets large, then the wavelength should get small. And I want to look at these graphs and see if any of them look that way. Uh, answer A says as the frequency gets bigger, as we go up on this axis, the wavelength also gets bigger. Well, that's not what happens. So A can't be the right answer. How about B? Well, B says as the, when the frequency is large, when I go up here high, the wavelength is small. Hmm, that's, that looks right. And uh, as we go out to longer and longer wavelengths, the frequency goes down. That one looks like the right answer to me, and in fact, it is the right answer. C shows the frequency increasing with wavelength and then dropping back down, and D shows kind of a random no relationship between frequency and wavelength. So that's not right. B is the right answer. Here's another question. What kind of wave is illustrated in this figure? And you see a picture here of four different waves. Okay, this question is testing your understanding of the definitions of the different types of waves. And so what we have over here in the picture is um, a piston with some particles and the piston pushes and you get a region of high density that then pushes through the medium and of course as it travels you get regions of low density in behind and if you push the piston back and forth periodically you'll get high density, low density, high density moving through the medium. So what kind of wave is that? Well this is a wave that where the disturbance is is happening in the same direction as the wave is traveling. And what kind of wave do we call that? This is just a definition question. It's a longitudinal or compression wave. Uh, remember that a transverse wave is one where the disturbance is perpendicular to the direction of travel of the wave. 
And this is not a transverse wave. A transverse wave would be like what happened when we shook the rope and got that sideways disturbance that was traveling uh, in a perpendicular direction. It's not a torsional wave. A torsional wave is a twist in a medium that goes through. And it's not a surface wave. Surface waves are like what you see on the surface of water or the way the ground moves in an earthquake. And this is not that kind. So the best answer to this is B. Okay, here's a picture that illustrates a wave phenomenon. What is this? You see that in the picture we have two wave sources here that are rippling outward and then there are patterns that happen where the waves overlap each other and in some places illustrated by these red lines uh, it looks like the wave is adding together and getting bigger. We call that constructive interference, remember that? And in some places the two waves interact and they cancel each other out as in these green lines. We call that destructive interference and the whole thing that you get is an interference pattern if you were to put a detector out here and look at how intense the waves are at different places. Um, so this is not reflection, it's not refraction, it's not diffraction even though it kind of looks like it. We often use diffraction and interference um, interchangeably but they're not the same thing. Diffraction is the bending or spreading that a wave does when it goes past a small object that's well comparable in size to its wavelength. Um, but interference is where you have multiple sources or even just the two edges of a slit uh, where the waves can add together or cancel each other out. Here's another one. If the light from a distant source is shifted to the blue relative to what you would observe from the same source in a laboratory, what does that tell you about the source? Take a second and answer. All right. Um, of course, what's talked about here is um, a blue shift. Later on in the course, we talk about red shift. But what does it mean? Well, this is Doppler shift, right? And what causes a Doppler shift? Doppler shift happens when the source is moving with respect to the observer. And if the source is moving toward the observer, then the waves will be shifted to higher frequency, or if it's light, to the blue, because blue is higher frequency than red. If the source is moving away, then the waves get stretched out and the, the frequency goes down and we call that a redshift. So if in this question it talks about distant source shifted to the blue, what does that mean? Well, it means it's moving toward you, which is answer A. It's not moving away. That would produce a redshift. And it's not absorbing the light between the source and you. That would just make it dimmer. Here's another one. Which of these forms of electromagnetic radiation has the shortest wavelength? Go ahead and answer. All right, this is basically a memorization question. You remember in class I told you that you should be generally familiar with the electromagnetic spectrum. So this is testing whether or not you are. So we need to look at each answer and just kind of think about where that fits in the electromagnetic spectrum. We know that blue light has shorter wavelength than red light. And blue light is certainly shorter wavelength than radio. Oh. But ultraviolet, that means beyond the violet. Ultraviolet has a shorter wavelength than any of A, B, or C. Oh, and wait a minute, gamma rays. Gamma rays are shorter wavelength than anything else because it goes gamma, then x-rays, then ultraviolet, then blue through red, then microwaves, and then, uh, oh, well, blue through red, infrared, microwaves, radio. All right, next question. Which of these is the strongest evidence for the particle nature of light? Go ahead and answer. All right, so we're looking for particle behavior. We need to look for something that only particles do. And so let's take a look at the answers. A says reflection. Well, reflection is something that both particles and waves do, so that can't be the right answer. Uh, diffraction, that's answer B. 
Well, diffraction is something that only waves normally do, classical waves, so that's not a good answer. And interference is the same thing. That's something that classical waves do, but particles don't do. But D, photoelectric effect, yes, that is good evidence for the particle nature of light. Remember, Einstein explained this photoelectric effect, and his explanation was that light was particulate. Uh, and of course, D is the right answer, which means E is wrong. But what is refraction? Well, refraction is the bending that light does when it moves from uh, a medium of one density to a medium of another density, uh, or it's like what happens when it it goes through a lens. It's the bending as it uh, you know, goes from air to water, for example. That's refraction. And that's not evidence of particle nature. That's something that waves do. For most materials, density increases in the order. Oh, go ahead and answer that. All right, this is sort of a memorization question. We looked at a lot of examples of this in class as we were kind of playing around with uh, materials. And we see that the, the least dense material is going to be gas. So I want an answer where gas is on the left because we have less than signs here. And the most dense material typically is the solid. And so answer B looks like the best one. Gas is less dense than liquid, which is less dense than solid. That's the order that increases. Which velocity distribution curve for helium gas represents helium at the highest temperature? And you've got A, B, and C there. Go ahead and answer. Again, I guess this is a question that's sort of testing memorization. But remember, we talked about the kinetic molecular theory of matter and of gases. And what we saw was that as you increase the temperature of a gas, the speed of the molecules in the gas does two things. One, the speed, the average speed increases. And two, the distribution of different possible speeds also spreads out. So looking at these three curves, if they're all helium, the A curve would be the lowest temperature helium because it has the lowest average speed, which is going to be right about there and the narrowest distribution there. B would be warmer. The average is going to be out here somewhere, and a much broader distribution. And the hottest gas would be C, because it has an average out about there, and by far the widest distribution. So the correct answer to this is C. And there you go. The black curve's at minus 100. The, the red one is, or brown one, is at 300, and the green one is at 1300 degrees centigrade. Oh, here's a similar question. Which velocity distribution curve for different gases at the same temperature is for the lightest gas? Take a second and answer that. This one uh, looks an awful lot like the last one. In fact, I think it is, well, it's not exactly the same set of curves. But uh, again, in this case, we have different gases. Uh, they all have the same temperature. And the question is, which is the lightest gas? Now remember that temperature refers to the average kinetic energy of the gas molecules. And kinetic energy is 1 half the mass times the velocity squared. Well, if 1 half mv squared is the same for all the different gases, but if m is different, then v also has to be different. And so if I have a light gas, that means m is small. And to make up for the small m, I have to have a large v. So which is for the lightest gas? It ought to be the one with the greatest speeds, which is curve c uh, out here. And the heaviest gas would be curve a. And let's see if I've got a reveal here. Uh, so the right answer to this question is lightest gas is C. And uh, sure enough, curve C is for helium, which has uh, an atomic weight of four atomic mass units. Curve B is nitrogen, molecular weight 28 atomic mass units. And curve A, the green one, is argon, 40 atomic mass units. 
a related question. Which gas would have the highest average molecular kinetic energy? Take a second and look at that. All right, let's answer it. So as we look through these answers, we see that it's helium at 300 Kelvin, nitrogen at 300 Kelvin, oxygen at 300 Kelvin, and then a couple more answers. Well, if they're all at the same temperature, A, B, and C, what does that mean? Temperature is a measure of average molecular kinetic energy. And so if all three of these gases are at 300 Kelvin, that means they would all have the same average molecular kinetic energy, and they do. So the right answer to this one is E. Which material would have the greatest internal energy? Go ahead and answer this one. All right, now this is a slightly different question. I'm not asking about kinetic energy. I'm asking about internal energy. And you'll notice that in this question, all four of the answers are at the same temperature, 273 Kelvin. And so if they're all at the same temperature, they would all have the same average kinetic energy. But the question is internal energy, and internal energy is made up of both kinetic and potential energy. So what we need to worry about here is whether the potential energies are the same, because the kinetic energies certainly are. So we've got water ice at 273 Kelvin, liquid water at 273 Kelvin, water vapor at 273 Kelvin, and a mixture of ice and liquid water at the same temperature. And uh, that's OK, because 273 Kelvin is the freezing point of water. So you can have ice and liquid water both there at the same time. Which has the greatest potential energy? Well, you have to add potential energy to ice to get it to come apart to become liquid water. And you have to add potential energy to liquid water to get it to come apart to become water vapor. So which has the greatest potential energy? It would be the water vapor. The kinetic energy is the same for all these answers. And so the right answer to this is C. One gram of water vapor at 273 Kelvin has the greatest internal energy. Here's another one. Which slit arrangement would produce the broadest photon diffraction pattern? Assume that all the slits are roughly comparable in size to the wavelength of the light. Go ahead and answer. All right, this problem is sort of uh, testing two things. It's testing if you understand diffraction, and it's also sort of an uncertainty principle question in disguise. So what would produce the broadest photon diffraction pattern? Well, it would be the narrowest slit, because the narrower the slit, as long as you're comparable to the wavelength of the light, the more the waves bend as they go through it. And why is that? Well, the slit defines where the photons have to go when they're going through. If they don't hit the slit, then they don't produce the, the uh, pattern on the other side. And if I make the slit narrower, that means I am increasing my knowledge of their position in this direction. But if I increase my knowledge of their position, I'm decreasing my knowledge of their momentum, which is the product of uh, mass times velocity. Now, if we're talking about photons, there's no mass involved, but there's still an uncertainty in wh where the photon's going to go once it goes through. And so I know less about the momentum of the photons in answer A. It's going to give me the broadest diffraction pattern, whereas C will give me the least uh, broad diffraction pattern. So the right answer to this is A. Which slit arrangement would produce the broadest electron diffraction pattern? And again, you're told to assume all the slits are roughly comparable in size to the wavelength of the electrons. Go ahead and answer. I hope you realize the right answer to this one is also A, for exactly the same reason as in the last problem. Because the slit is the narrowest, that means I know the most about position for the electrons as they go through this slit, and that means I know the least 
about their momentum in that direction, which means they'll be more spread out when they hit the detector than they would be if they went through B or C. So the right answer to this is A. Which picture represents one of the standing probability wave patterns for an atom? Go ahead and answer. Okay, this question is testing whether you recognize what orbitals look like. Remember that orbitals are those standing probability wave solutions to the Schrodinger equation for an atom. They are uh, predictions of where you would find an electron if you went looking for one around the atomic nucleus. And the only picture here that looks like an orbital is C. C is a p-type orbital. Remember the shapes of the orbitals? You have spherical s orbitals. None of these is spherical. Then you have the dumbbell-shaped p orbitals. That's what C is. And then you have the cloverleaf-shaped d orbitals. Um, those are the only ones we really worried about you knowing. So the right answer to this is C. Okay, what does this figure illustrate? You have a picture of a car moving here with Waves coming out one side close together and spread out on the other side. Go ahead and answer. All right, of course, what this picture is really illustrating is the Doppler effect, the Doppler shift. If you honk the horn of the car, it will produce waves of a certain wavelength, but they com get compressed in the direction the car is moving and stretched out in the direction the car is moving away from. And so we call that a Doppler shift. It's not the uncertainty principle, which has to do with uh, predicting momentum and position, how exactly you can know both of those at the same time. It's not diffraction. Diffraction is the spreading of waves as they go through an opening. There's no opening here. It's not the Pauli exclusion principle, which talks about how if electrons are in the same orbital, they have to differ in spin. It's Doppler shift. All right, back to some review material. Uh, now we're talking about the chemistry part of the unit. So um, some key things about the periodic table. The reason the periodic table was discovered is because there are patterns in the way that the chemical reactivity of the elements changes, and Mendeleev noticed that way back in the in the mid 1800s and he arranged the chemical elements by a property called their atomic weight and uh, noticed that there were patterns in their behaviors um, it turned out that that wasn't exactly the right thing to do but it was so close to the right thing that it worked the the property that we use today to arrange them by is something called atomic number, which is the number of protons in the atomic nucleus. I'm going to turn this so it always stays as an arrow. There we go. Um, and so if we arrange the elements that way by atomic number, and we have to throw in some things that we learn from quantum mechanics as well, then things that are in the same column have similar chemical behavior and we call things in the same column a family of elements and there are certain families that I want you to know about this first column called column 1A is called the alkali metals because all of these are metals and all of them react with water when you put them in water to make hydrogen and uh, all of them make a basic solution when you stick them in water uh, column 7A, which is this next to the last one, is called the halogens. Halogen, the word halogen comes from uh, Greek halo, which is salt, and gen, which means former. It's the same gen as genesis. So these are all elements that react with metals over here to form salts. So that's why they're called the halogens. Uh, the last column, column 8A, is another one you should know. Those are called the noble gases. They're noble in the sense that they don't mingle with the commoners. They don't react. So chemical nobility means unreactive. And these are the so-called noble or inert gases. Um, remember also that you can look at the periodic table and predict certain properties of the atoms. And in particular, uh, atomic size is one of those. 
Atomic size increases as you go down a column in the periodic table because as you go down, the outermost electrons are in larger and larger quantum shells. And so uh, size gets big as you go down. But as you go across any particular row, the size actually decreases, which is kind of surprising. But the reason that it does that is because as you go across, you're adding protons to the nucleus, making it more positive. You're also adding electrons to the outermost shell. But the positive charge in the nucleus wins and helps to suck those electrons in a little bit tighter. And so that's why it gets smaller. And uh, we call that a, a shielding effect. So what does this mean? It means that the alkali metals are the large atoms, and um, the size goes down. You get over here, these will be the smaller atoms over here. And of course, the biggest ones are down at the bottom left corner of the periodic table, and the smallest ones are at the upper right. Oh, do you remember how you put electrons in to do uh, electron configurations? We can represent the various orbitals in an atom by lines, and what's not shown on this little diagram is that as you go up, you're going up in energy. And when you put electrons in, you always put them in the lowest energy available orbital, and you have to put in the right number of electrons, which you can read from the periodic table. So neutral iron has 26 protons in its nucleus. That means it will have 26 electrons. And if we put our 26 electrons in, here's how they have to go. So 1, 2, 3, 4. Notice when I put two electrons in the same orbital, they have to differ in spin. And the spin is indicated with the direction of the arrow. So up means up spin, and down means down spin. And, well, remember spin is just a quantum mechanical property that has mathematical uh, similarity to a spinning object. It's not really spinning, but that's just how we describe the electrons. So I've got four in. The fifth one goes here in the p orbital, but there are three p orbitals. p orbitals always come in sets of three. So my next electron goes in the other p orbital because I don't want to spin pair them until I have to. That's called Hund's rule. So I've got now, let's see, seven, and then the eighth has to spin pair, ninth, tenth like that. The next electrons will go up here, so 11 and 12 go in the 3s. Then we start filling the 3p, and it works the same way, so 13, 14, 15, and then spin pair 16, 17, 18. And then, interestingly, the 4s orbital is lower in energy than the 3d, and you can tell that by looking at the periodic table and looking at how it's organized. Remember, we did this in class. So 19 and 20 go in the 4s, and then my remaining six electrons go up here in the 3d, and again, I want to put them in different orbitals if I can. So there's 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, and the 26th one has to be spin paired. And we can learn a lot just by looking at this about the chemical properties of iron. So looking at the periodic table again and various uh, properties that change uh, that you can predict as you look at the periodic table, atomic size or atomic volume, what's the trend in atomic sizes? Well, size goes up as you go down a column and it decreases as you go left to right across. And we can graph it and see this is how it works. So going down this first column, lithium's small, and then it gets bigger as you go to sodium and potassium and rubidium and cesium. But notice if we fill it in, it goes down as you go across. And there are even some exceptions to that. And so be careful about just interpolating, guessing in between the known elements. Here's another uh, problem. Using the periodic table and this graph of atomic volume versus atomic number, which family of elements tends to have the largest atomic volumes in any given row? Now, uh, if you see a question like this on your exam, I would strongly encourage you to use your periodic table because you're given one with the exam. Um, so you could use a periodic table in answering this now. Go ahead and answer it. 
All right, we're looking for elements that have the largest atomic volumes. Well, that would be like lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. What elements, what family are they in? Well, that's that first column called the alkali metals. So there's some memorization you have to do to answer this question. Um, so the right answer to this is A, alkali metals. Here's another one where you'd want to use your periodic table. Comparing F, which is fluorine, NE, which is neon, BR, which is bromine, and CS, which is cesium, which would you predict is the largest atom? Go ahead and answer. I hope that you picked, whoops, sorry, that you picked cesium for that. Uh, because cesium is down at the bottom left of the periodic table where the biggest atoms are. All the others are further up and to the, to the right. They're small. Next question. From which family is it most difficult to remove electrons? Go ahead and answer this. Okay, remember that that process of removing electrons is called ionization. And so what's plotted in this graph is the ionization energy. That's the energy required to cause ionization versus atomic number. And you see that the ones that have high ionization energies are helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon. And they form a family. Which family is that? Well, that's the one over on the far right side, that column of the snotty gases or the noble gases. So C, noble gases, is the correct answer here. The noble gases have the highest ionization energies. It's hardest to take electrons away from them. I did want to briefly mention shielding. I talked about this earlier, but remember that the size of the atom depends on how big the outermost occupied orbitals are, and the size of the orbitals depends on the attraction between the nucleus, which has Z, positive charges in it, Z is just the number of protons, and the electrons. And so if you have electrons in not in the outermost shell but in inner ones, those electrons are negatively charged and they kind of block some of that positive charge from being seen by the outer electrons. We call that uh, screening or shielding and that means that the effective charge of the nucleus, Z effective, is less than the actual charge. And so as we add electrons to the same shell, they don't screen each other very well. They're all pretty far out. It's only the ones that are in closer that do the screening. Um, so for example, p orbitals have no probability of being at the nucleus. That wave function has a node at the nucleus. And so p orbitals can't screen nearly as well as s orbitals can, which can get down to the nucleus. As you move left to right across the periodic table, you are adding electrons, but all electrons in the same outermost shell. They don't screen each other very well. But you're also adding protons to the nucleus, so Z is getting bigger. And as you make Z bigger, the charge on the nucleus, the effective charge of the nucleus increases, and that's why the atoms get smaller. Hope that makes sense. So the key to chemistry is that it's the number and arrangement of electrons in the outermost or highest energy orbitals that determines all the chemical properties. And for us that's very fortunate because it means we don't have to worry about all those core electrons. We only have to worry about the valence electrons, the outermost ones, and chemistry is complicated enough as it is. So not having to worry about the core electrons is a good thing. The reason that the periodic table works is because if you have elements in the same column of the periodic table, that means they have the same electronic structure, the same number and type of outer electrons. So that's why it all works the way it does. So again, here's the periodic table, and um, you can see that you can read off this energy ordering of the various orbitals, which are represented by lines here, um, in the periodic table. So in the first row, there are two elements, hydrogen and helium. The hydrogen's in there twice. That's not just to confuse you, but it's because hydrogen is special. It can, 
It's, it's got only one valence electron, so it behaves a lot like the alkali metals, but it's also one electron short of a filled shell, so in that sense, it behaves like the halogens, which are all one electron short of a filled shell. But the point is, there are only two elements in the first row because the 1s orbital, which is being filled in the first row, can take two electrons. They have to differ in spin. As we go across, the next uh, orbital to be filled will be 2s, so that's kind of lithium and beryllium right there. Then there's a gap, and we jump over here, and there's a group of six elements corresponding to these three p orbitals that can have two electrons each. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And once we get to neon, all of these energy levels are filled. Then we jump down to the next row, and we start to fill 3s, and then 3p. So the same thing happening here. You get... Uh, Two, two electrons in the 3s orbital and six in the, in the three 3p orbitals. And then something weird happens. You'd expect 3d to be the next one to fill, but it doesn't. It's 4s. And if you go back over into the next row, you see you got to fill the s's first. So potassium and calcium represent this 4s getting filled. And only after that do we start filling the 3d. And remember, d orbitals come in sets of five, and so there are ten elements across here from scandium to zinc. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, uh, corresponding to these five d orbitals with two electrons each. And then you go back and fill in 4p. And then 5s is the next one. And then once again, we got to get 4d next as we go from yttrium across to cadmium. Uh, and then 5p fills, and then after that, we have to jump down and do 4f. So the way the periodic table really ought to look is like this, that shows the energies, or that shows which orbitals are getting filled in the different blocks of the table. We never show it this way because it's just too wide on the page, so it's easier to take these f elements out and stick them down below and make everything more compact. So again, it's a bit of good luck that it's only the valence electrons we have to worry about for chemistry. Uh, the core electrons don't have to be worried about, and that makes chemistry simpler, thank goodness. So again, the periodic table is explained by the quantum mechanical model. Um, so if you have things in the same column, the valence electrons are the same type. So in this first column, for the alkali metals, they all have a single S-type valence electron. And that means that all of these alkali metals react similarly. They all tend to want to lose that one S electron. And uh, likewise, in the next column, they have two S electrons, and those react similarly. They're called the alkaline earths, although that's not something I think we expect you to know. But they tend to lose both of their valence electrons. And if we get over here, I mean, these are all p-type valence electrons. And if you're in the same column, things react similarly. And I don't know why I put that arrow there, but that's where it is. So those, those behave similarly. <clears throat> all of them in this column behave similarly. They're the, the halogens. They <clears throat> are all one electron short of having a filled shell. So they tend to want to react in ways that will get them one more electron. Of course, the last column, the noble gases, all behave similarly in that they don't react. They have filled shells. And uh, same thing is true of this column. And pick any column in the periodic table. That's how it works. OK. If you need more review material, I'd strongly encourage you to go to ps100.byu.edu and look over on the left-hand side under Help Resources, Find Practice Problems. That will give you problems grouped by chapter with tutorial material, and you can use that to review for your unit exam or for your final exam. That's really a good way to do it. Good luck as you take these exams, and uh, I hope you do your very best, and I hope this has been of some help to you. Thank you, and bye.